Okay, Spiritual Sunday from live from Boca Raton, Florida. So let's start with uh, our affirmation. And again, just a quick reminder, we're affirming the truth because the more we'll tell the truth, the faster we'll be able to catch up with all the falsehoods that we grew up with, right? I think one of my favorites is, uh, as I grew up, they always told us, you do not go outside with wet hair, you'll catch a cold. But do you know, 100% of the time that I went outside with wet hair, didn't catch a cold. And then science came along and said, ah, oh, no, you, that's not really true, right? So think about it. This is why the Rav used to always say, Kabbalah is 50th century science. And at that time, the, the scientists were in the 20th century. So we were only 3,000 years ahead. So science is still uncovering facts that the Zohar wrote about in its written form 2,000 years ago. So for me, the simple logical question, which I've come very clearly to see logic is not logic. Do you remember uh, Mr. Spock in the original uh, Star Trek, right? He was supposed to be so logical, but he was half human. So here everything was logic, 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 and every now and then one of the episodes, they show him a little emotional, right? Like the logic flew out. So you think scientists in general, again, we're not disrespectful of people, we're understanding how things happen. They're supposed to be completely logical and objective. Isn't that the essence of science, right? Logical and objective. So for me, one of the most impactful awarenesses, if, whatever it was, three, four hundred years ago, a small, um, little-known physicist called Sir Isaac Newton, right? He's only got a whole section of physics named after him, Newtonian physics. If he wrote and you can find the writings, that he, everything he discovered, as we call his scientific discoveries, he found based in the Zohar. So you'd think if a great scientist like that claimed that all of the science that he supposedly discovered that was new from most people's point of view, not from the Kabbalist point of view, but new from that, wouldn't you think that if you were a scientist looking for answers to the universe, you would say, hey, if Isaac Newton says all of his scientific discoveries came from the Zohar, maybe we should look into the Zohar for answers. You want to know how to cure disease, you want to know how to take away pollution, all that stuff, free energy or whatever, you, like this, wouldn't you think it makes sense to just look into the Zohar? Or am I crazy? Is that not logical? Right? So how come they're not doing it? Because like Mr. Spock, he had his objective side, but he also had his human side. And as you and I know, and we'll talk, of course, a little more today about that challenge in our head, basically takes away the logic. Just let the emotions take over. So we have our affirmation because we want to keep awakening the truth of the light inside of us and what, in simple terms, our essence of our purpose in this world is. Because like the Rav and Karen used to teach us, the opponent... Okay, Satan, right, the adversary, has told us a lie a thousand times till we believe it. So we have to tell the truth a thousand and one times so we'll believe the truth. The trouble is it's not just linear that way. It's not like the moment you come to the Kabbalah Center, that opponent stops talking to you, and now we only have a thousand and one times we have to tell the truth. No, every time we tell the truth, this, uh, that opponent, that Satan, wants to get in there and tell us two more lies to try and always stay ahead. So we have to speed up the process, and that's why it's great at least once a week, but go online, take a copy, take a picture of it or whatever, and just keep saying it every day, along with I'm a pure and perfect being of light, so that we keep telling the truth faster than that opponent has told us lies. So we'll catch up quicker, because the faster we catch up, then the faster we'll be able to get out of all this pain, suffering, and chaos. So let's say it together. Let me give you here in person. So we say together, consciousness is everything. I raise my consciousness today to see the miracles and wonders of life. I commit myself to behave with greater love, compassion, and kindness towards all human beings. Greater and all are the two operative words there. We can all do more, share more to all people. Okay, let's see what we'll get today, how maybe we'll be more motivated to do that. So the, well, I guess with inflation, so the billion-dollar question of humanity, 
probably since the beginning of time. Why is this happening to me? No? Why is this happening to me? The issue is, if you think first and foremost, when do people ask that question? When challenges, bad things happen. How come you don't hear that question about when the good things happen? The guy just won the lottery. Why is this happening to me? Just got a promotion. Why is this happening to me? No, people don't ask that question. They want to know when there's difficulty and challenges in their life. Why is this happening to me? I'm such a good person. And then they look out at the world and they see people who are not so nice. And they have all kinds of good stuff. So if we really break it down, what's the real question we're asking? That question, what is the real essence behind that, those, uh, that phrase? Why is this happening to me? Simple terms, what are they saying? I don't see the system. Any of you drive a car? Yes? Okay. Well, in, in your case, I'm not sure we call it driving. The car moves, but I'm not sure it's driving. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's a few things one before you get in your car or before your parents let you drive way back when you had to know the system of the car right brake makes the car stop gas makes the car go d means forward r means reverse you had to understand the system now how many of you really <clears throat> except for our one joker in the room how many of you when you put the car in d expected to go backwards or when you put it in R, you expect to go forwards, right? That would be when you'd ask, why is this happening, right? But you'd still know there's a system, so you take it to the repair, to the mechanic, to repair it, right? Because you understand there's a system. When, so when people are asking, why is this happening to them, the issue is they don't understand the system. They thought they knew a system. What do we all grow up with? Be nice, be kind, everything will work out. Right? Get a good education, you'll have a good job, you'll make a lot of money, you'll have a nice life. Well, when those things start to fall apart, then what do people say? Why is it happening? Because that's the system they believed the universe worked by. Right? If you're a good person, good things come to you. Bad people, bad things come to you. So when they see confusion, they don't see that, then people ask, why? Why? What's going on? What's going on? So you and I want to understand because we've learned from the class one, Kabbalah one, everything in the universe is exactly cause and effect. There's no such thing as randomness. Everything is cause and effect. So why don't we see it, right? Because if we look at good people, bad things happen. We look at bad people, good things happen. Where's the cause and effect? So you and I have come to understand there's two realms we live in, the 1% to 99%. The 1% is the physical material world of the five senses. The 99% is the world of the sixth sense or intuition or something beyond our five senses. So I'd like to share with you just probably for some of you a reminder to reawaken. It's funny. What does that opponent in our head keep doing? Keeps reminding us that there's chaos in the world. And then points out all the reasons that it happens, that it can validate it, right? Look at this like this. Why did the bad things happen to good people? So that voice in our head says, see, there's no real system to the world. It's all random. It's all chaotic. But like, for me, simple objectivity, if people really, in their, in their deep down heart or brain, really believed the universe was random, what would they do when they opened their eyes in the morning? Just shut them and go back to sleep. Why get up? Why go to work? Why do anything? Why do people go to work? Because they believe in simple terms there's a system. They put in their 40, 60, 80 hours and they get a paycheck. So what happens if they put in 40 hours? No paycheck. In fact, what if the, the business took money out of their account? Right? They'd be a little upset. You follow the idea? So we all live in some form that there's a system. And yet, that parasitic voice we call the opponent has made us believe that things are random, coincidental, and accident, which I also like that term. Don't you like the term accident? 
Because the first thing two people, when they get out of the car, because their cars met in the middle of the intersection, that we call an accident. Doesn't accident mean random? So if it's random, how come the first thing those two drivers do is try and establish what? Guilt, blame. Well, no, it's random. So there's no one to blame. Uh-uh, so we don't. If you look objectively at yourself or other people, nobody lives in this world as if it's random. Or they'd never get out of bed. Why would you bother? Because there's no system. And the system can't be temporary, right? It's going to work for a little while, then fall apart. Then it's going to work for a little while, fall apart. Because in the big picture, that's still randomness, chaos. So it's one or the other. So we understand that it's all cause and effect. So why is it we can't see it? So 36 years ago, and it's not that I hadn't seen these things before, but as we affirm, consciousness is everything. Fundamental teaching in the center, consciousness, the way you think, the way you understand the universe to operate is how you're going to operate. So when you change your consciousness, you change the way you look at the world, you change the way you act, and action is what causes the reaction. Your thoughts influence your action. The way you perceive the world influence the way you act in the world. And as soon as you set an action in motion, the universe is setting up to bring it back to you. So how many of you ever been to or seen on television or on the internet a magic show? Sure. So why are you interested? Why are you entertained by a magician or even as they've now called themselves an illusionist? Because they're fooling your five senses. And the better they fool your five senses, the more successful they are. Yes? I mean, if they, if they took the empty box and they say, here's an empty box, abracadabra, look, empty box. <laughs> Two or three tricks like that, you'd want your money back, you'd boo, you'd run out, etc. But when they say, here, empty box, and then the next thing you know, they're pulling a lion out of a little hat, you go, wow! That's amazing. They must have studied deep Kabbalah because they know how to create a live animal out of thin air. No, we don't believe that, do we? We believe somehow they fooled our five senses. So, 36 years ago when I started in the center, what did I learn from my teacher, the Rabbi Karen? That's the point. Realize your five senses don't see everything. They don't always tell you the truth. All you have to do is think the last time you went in your house, you put the keys on the table by the door, and then when you were in a rush to go somewhere important, you couldn't find the keys on the table. I think it only happened to me. Ever happened to you guys out there? These people, they're not fooled like that. What is that? And then you run around the house, and then five minutes later, you go back to the table, and there's the keys. Ever had that experience? Or you're looking for your glasses and you run around the house and then all of a sudden you feel on the top of your head, oh, there they are. So I did see like a, one of these like Twilight Zone shows once where they showed something that, I, that now I make fun of. That, you know, the world was being built, let's say five minutes ahead of time by all of these, whatever you want to call them, angels or entities or whatever, they were sort of making the world ahead of them. So when I first saw that and I started to come to teach Kabbalah, I said, you know what? The keys, you don't see them. Because why? Those fairies came to the house. They took it away. You're running around the house. And then they're laughing at you because then they put it back on the table. So when you come there, there it is again. But all along the way, these little angels or angelic things, taking it away and putting it there. The glasses weren't on your head. They took it away. You couldn't find it. And then five minutes later, they snuck it on your head. And you go, oh, there it is. Now you know why they say Kabbalah drives you crazy. Because it's either that or our five senses were fooled. Do you remember as a kid, somebody would take out this thing looks like a whistle, you hear no sound. But all of a sudden, all the dogs in the neighborhood barking. No? Do they still have those? Yeah, okay. I haven't heard one yet. <laughs> but if you think about it, why can the dog hear it? Why do they react that we don't? Because our hearing, our ears are not as sensitive to sound as theirs. That's all. 
which means it's not a bad thing, although some people might say, you know, some dogs are better than some people they know. But that's only on the outside. On the inside, we're all beings of light. Remember that. Okay, but you're getting the point. Because our five senses are limited, that's why we don't see the cause and effect. We don't see the reason behind things that come to us. So what do we learn in the center? Understand one way or another, however you'd like to understand, everything is cause and effect. And those who've been uh, following us consistently, you know, I've shared here and there some of the cases that I personally know of. I think I told you this one, no? When I first came to the center in 1988 as a teacher, there was somebody in the center at that point, the first moment I met them, couldn't stand me. I didn't know why. I couldn't figure out, maybe because I was American, and I was the first American other than the Raven Carrot, so maybe that had something. I couldn't figure out why. Why every chance to needle, criticize this and this and this? Okay, so what do we learn in the center? As we'll talk about it, the steps to change things in our life. So I'm putting him to, you. okay, I feel it. he wants to be that way. I don't want to be involved in his movie. So over the years, years, but still, something, something, something. Okay. Now, two, two years ago, in a meditation, I saw my past life. Cut to the chase. We were walking in the streets, certain place 2,000 years ago, and he did something that was so disrespectful and made me so angry. I just pulled out my sword right then and there and hacked him to death. So once I saw that, I said, oh, no wonder he didn't like me from the first moment. Right? Now, I'm sure he didn't know that he was just acting on the voice of the, that opponent inside him for whatever it was, just to be mean and nasty. Because remember, yes, he was mean and nasty to me, but after a while I started to notice he had little aspects of that with everybody. Because how we act in one place in our life is how we will act in some level in every place in our life. So the fact that he was always needling or criticizing me or whatever, yeah, I came to see exactly the cause and effect of it, but he was doing it with a lot of people. That was just his nature because he didn't wake up his consciousness enough to change. So that was just him. Did a lot of nice things and good things, but he also had that side to him. So there's nothing that's not cause and effect. Nothing. Just because you don't see it. Even the rabbi would say, in this, in this lifetime, can you tell me... Think. Let's not even ask the question, because I know we all have it. Think of a time when you were young. Six, eight, to maybe 16, 18, something like that. Think of a time that you got really upset and angry at somebody. All the scowls, that no good. Think of, the, think of, think of the times that you were like that that you don't remember. If let's say at twelve you got really angry at somebody, doesn't matter who, did you scream and yell? And let's not be okay. Just scream and yell, criticize whatever you did, made fun of them, this, that, and the other thing. If that was, at that point, your nature, and you didn't change it, somewhere when you were later teens, 20s, 30s, you did something similar to other people. If I asked you to remember every time you did that, could you? No. But there's an effect of that. So then, unbeknownst to you, when somebody came along and screamed at you, when you were having a good day, what did you say? God, why is it happening to me? I'm so nice. Well, you can't even remember in this lifetime every time you misbehaved to somebody. Imagine all the past lifetimes that you did things. So again, it's cause and effect. Doesn't excuse the other person. Let's not forget that. Everybody, based on their actions, has cause and effect. So they have their cause and effect completely separate from my cause and effect unless you decide that you're going to handcuff yourself to them you're going to immerse yourself in their mud and be involved in and experience some of what they experience. But you volunteered for that. They didn't make you do that. You did it. Because why? 
in your lack of seeing cause and effect, in your lack of understanding, it was exactly the payment or the opportunity to pay back what you had done, maybe to them or to somebody else, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or longer than that. When you didn't see that, then by your screaming, yelling, being upset, having anger, want vengeance, you just got in the mud with them. So whatever happened to them is happening to you also. Because you took that cause and effect upon you. You acted in a way to handcuff yourself, tie yourself with them, so that wherever they went, you were there with them. It's not difficult. Technically, you had two separate cause and effect, but you took your cause and effect and decided you wanted to be with them. So even if you were 50,000 miles away from them, I just realized how stupid that is. If you go 50,000 miles away from somebody, where do you end up? Pretty much back with them, right? The earth is only 24,000 miles around. So if you go 48,000 miles, you're back with them again. So <laughs> if you're 12,000 miles away from them, so you're physically on opposite ends of the earth, but you reacted to them when that event happened, you're still handcuffed to them. So over there, they're getting the response, the effect of their negative action to you, but at the same time, you're getting the same thing, even though you're 12,000 miles away, because you've tied yourself to them and their correction, their tikkun, we call it, their karma. Ooh, you should be getting hot under the collar now. Why am I that stupid to do that? They did a nasty thing, and then I'm giving a chance to do it again? I remember one of the teachers, first time I heard it. The mule kicks me, shame on the mule. The mule kicks me again, shame on me. Because if you keep putting yourself in the same situation over and over again, don't expect different results. We even call that stupidity, no? Doing the same thing over again and expecting the same results or different results? Foolish. Foolish. Okay. So we have to start being able to see, because why? The universe is coded. It's a code. Think, the, think in, in the war, right, or, or, or the spy movies. People want to send a coded message, yes? So what's the ideal message? The ideal message, the real message encoded inside the words, let's say, that are being written, Inside, you want to tell the person that you're sending the message to exactly what you want them to do, exactly what the message is. But you surround that message, ideally, with something that sounds sensible, but sends the person who's trying to intercept the message to go to somewhere completely different. You following? You want to send somebody to the right, so you encode a message, go to the right. But what you write on the external, is something about, yes, if you want to go, we want to send you to the left. So the people who are intercepting the message say, oh, the message is go to the left. When the real message inside is go to the right. So everything in our life is an encoded message. The most valuable ones are when we're challenged. The difficult situations, the challenges that come our way, the traumatic things that happen to us, the nasty things that happen to us, they are encoded. So you and I from Kabbalah one forward, and I give you sort of a um, Reader's Digest version of that today, we learn how to unlock the code. Because if we read the real code, if we can see the real code and get the real message, what can we do? Now we have an understanding. There is a system. We understand now how to see the system through the outside illusionary message. And therefore, we have greater control over our destiny, which is really what we want, isn't it? That's why we want to know the system. You want to know how a car operates and what the rules of the road are so you can operate in a way that gets you to your destination without harm. Efficiently, effectively, and without harm. But if you don't know the system, can't do that. It's not going to work so well. So you're talking about life, the quantum aspect of life. We need to know the system to control our destiny. And that's why the question, why is this happening to me? Because it throws what I thought was a system out of whack. Be good, get good. No, because all of us have that other side. And don't say, well, but that, Chaim, that was only when I was 15 I got mad at that person. Great. So here's where science is validating Kabbalah. Energy cannot be destroyed. 
and it doesn't disappear, it can only be transformed. So at 15, you scream and yell at somebody because you were upset at them, and you're now 85. So 70 years later, that 15-year-old inside the 85-year-old is still screaming and yelling. And like we said, if you look objectively at the life of that 85-year-old, you can find over and over and over where they screamed and yelled, they criticized, they wanted to have revenge on somebody, they were judging them, all that stuff. Because the energy didn't change. They didn't transform it. That's why we're learning here how to transform energy. Not just let it dissipate. It doesn't dissipate. Ooh, yes, I can hear it. All the calculations. No, Chaim doesn't understand that situation. Doesn't understand that thing that happened to me and how terrible they were. So, of course, what else could I do? So, I want to help you eliminate from your vocabulary the phrase, they made me do it. Whatever the do it is. Because when do we say that? Again, do we say, they made me pick those numbers and win the lottery? Oh, no. In fact, there's stories like that where people will claim after the fact, no, but I gave you the dollar for that ticket. So you owe me half, and now they have a fight over it. Right? Again, it's only about bad stuff. They made me scream at them. They made me hate them. They made me seek revenge. They made me jealous of them. No such thing. No such thing. Go back on the YouTube page and look for Stop Taking the Pen. That video. Nobody makes you do it. You do it. But the moment you say, they made me, what are you really saying? I have no control over my life. I gave it away to them. So it's another way. We jump in the mud with them. So whatever they do, we get. But we volunteered for it. That's the key to remember. They didn't force you to jump in the mud with them. They didn't force you to tie yourself to them. You did it voluntarily because you listened to that negative voice in your head. The opponent, the parasite. Now remember, what's the purpose of that parasite? We programmed it like a video. You know, today, a program. We created a computer program, put it in our head. So it's not the real us. But what fun is a video game if there's no opponent? If there's no challenge? You know, in the old days, and I have certain people probably watching going to say, Chaim, you're showing your age. Okay. Good. Why not? I should be proud of it. But in the old days, right, imagine you bought a jigsaw puzzle. 5,000 pieces. You're so excited, right? You're going to really, you're going to have so much fun putting that 5,000 piece puzzle together. You get home the box, you open it up, and as you take it out, it's folded like a tablecloth. So all you have to do is unfold it, and there it is, 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. Same picture, but you can see all the pieces, but now it's all been put together for you. The picture on the box. Are you happy? No. Yeah. <laughs> then you didn't really want to do it in the first place. Okay. You're not happy. Why? Because the challenge was putting the pieces together. That was the fun. When you put it all together, then you felt accomplished. The fact you just opened the box and took it out, it's already done. No accomplishment. So what would life be if there wasn't an antagonist? That's the point. So we, in order to give us free will, because our only purpose in this world is to use our free will, which means we have to have free will to act like the Creator, act like the light all the time, 24-7, under all conditions. That's it. And you know what you get for that? The more you act unconditionally like the light, just shine light, shine light, especially into the face of darkness, what do you get for it? More light and more blessing and more fulfillment and you're uncovering more of your piece of heaven on earth that's been set out for you since the moment you came into this world. So it's not a little bit of something. It's not like, oh, you put the 5,000 piece puzzle together and you brag to the people who come to the house. No. Every part of the universe acknowledges your success when you overcome that challenger and you act like the light. The whole universe bows to you metaphorically brings you the good that you put out into the universe. Because you took some of the darkness, you shine light into the darkness. 
And therefore that light goes around the cosmos, the entire universe will acknowledge it to you, and good will come back to you sometime, someplace, in the right way, in the right form, for your highest good. You just have to have trust. That's what we're understanding. See beyond your five senses. Don't let your five senses determine how you perceive the world. Remember the dog whistle. So, if you took a dog whistle thinking you got a coach's whistle, and you go, and nothing comes out, what would you probably do? Throw it away. Go back, ask for your money back or something. But it's because you didn't understand that your hearing, your ears are not sensitive enough to hear the sound that it made. But a dog can. Like animals that can see at night, or you put the night vision goggles on, you see at night. Not because they project light, like, you know, the coal miners things that has a little flashlight on top. No, because it's more sensitive than our eyes to the infinite, even physical light that exists everywhere. No less the spiritual light. So you and I want to have an opening to our spiritual eyes to be able to see it or even just feel from your heart cause and effect. Okay, it's not nice what they did, but what do I want? What do I want in my life? So here, let me give you a few ways. Okay, four points how to unlock the code of what the challenge is doing for you, what the real message of the challenge is. Okay? So the first step is, has to be a challenge. That's the first thing. Something's got to push your button and start to wake up some kind of negative emotion. So the first step, once you're triggered, stop, halt, pause, freeze. Okay. I think they still play it, so it doesn't have to show my age. Simon says, right? Simon says, stop. You know, it's a whole thing. You have to get to the, you know, freeze. Okay, freeze. So when you're triggered, remember, your soul is saying no. That's the first step. Because I want to be able to understand the message my soul is sending to me. Because it may not be easy to accept, but I ask you, don't just reactively dismiss it. We learn from Kabbalah 1, class 2. Our soul is basically writing the script of our life and will put us in challenging situations to point out, like we said, that I still have the 15-year-old inside me that was screaming and yelling and it has yet to be transformed. So at your current age, you're still screaming and yelling in various ways, even if it's in your own head. Because you can't yell at the boss or the police or whoever it might be, the authority, because what might happen to you? But you're screaming in your head the same way you did when you were 15. Pause. I want to know what my soul is telling me. Second step. For me, it's the most probably important and yet so easily overlooked. So once you freeze, once you pause, ask yourself, what are you feeling? I don't think it's a difficult question. Something happens, something goes on, you're feeling triggered, right? A button is being pushed. Freeze, pause, halt, stop. And ask yourself, what's the emotion that I'm feeling? Which is in simplest terms, what's the button they're pushing? When the lights go out in your house and you have 20 circuit breakers, what do you want to know? Which circuit breaker broke? Which means you're going to find a way to identify the one that was triggered. So that's the same thing. We got a few buttons inside of us, a few circuit breakers. People, places, and things will push one of them. It will go off. Pause. Stop. Ask yourself, what are you feeling? That's all the message from your soul. What's that emotion? The third step. What do I want to come back to me? If I'm honest with myself, as you're learning to be more and more now, so the emotion waking up, revenge. I have to seek revenge. Pause. Okay, I'm feeling the button of revenge being pushed. Now ask yourself, if the universe is cause and effect, if I act in the same reactive way I did all those number of times, 
revenge will go out, it'll come back. Someone will seek revenge on me. The universe will seek revenge on me. It'll go out like this, out like this, the same. Is that what you want to come back to you? Or would you rather have forgiveness, tolerance, kindness, compassion come back to you? That's what you've got to ask yourself. What do I want to come back to me? So the Rav and Karen taught me for 30 some odd years. And sometimes, you know, you have to hear it, like we said, you have to hear it so many times until you kind of start to get it. What do you want? Do you want to be right or do you want the light? So our five senses will tell us, oh no, they said the nasty thing? They're making me scream at them. They're making me seek revenge. Not true, we said. It's my choice. But do I want to be right? Oh, they did the bad thing, so I got to show them. Or do I want the light? So when I'll act with compassion or forgiveness, that'll go out in the universe. It'll come back to me. The light will come back to me. They'll get stuck in their negativity because they sent out whatever it was they did in a nasty way. That'll go out and come back to them. And because I'm acting the opposite way, which is the fourth step, then do the action of kindness, compassion, forgiveness, whatever it is. So that you're shining more light, they're still stuck in the darkness, opposites repel. So you've just unleashed yourself from them. So when they walk away and you walk away, even though you're now 12,000 miles apart, they're in their mud and you're in more light. So the fourth step, take the action. Whatever the opposite of the negative emotion showing up, that's what you want to do because that's what you want to come back to you. Now, whether you felt it, saw it, or you're just holding the consciousness of it, you have just unlocked the code that your soul has been sending you the message. But it has to be coded because we're in the 1% physical world. So basically, all the messages we get, unless you're literally just learning in the center where we're teaching you how to unlock the code, how to understand the code in the system. But once you go out there, everything's coded. Because the physical world, the five senses have its influence, the soul's voice has its influence. We're the ones who decide which to listen to and which to follow. But it's all going to come coded that way. Even when you look in the mirror and you take yourself to task for something, it's still a coded message. Yeah, sure, you maybe did that foolish thing. Okay, but that, whatever it was, something pushed your button and you just reacted. So when you look in the mirror, your soul is telling you the same thing, even though it's you to you. Pause, what are you feeling? Okay, I'm feeling stupid because I acted in what? An angry way, a jealous way, a guilt way, a shame way, a fearful way, whatever it is. Okay, so pause. What is it that really I'm upset at myself? Identify the emotion again and then decide what do you want out in the universe? So the beauty of that rule, energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed. How long, in a physical world, how long will that, does that rule last? As long as the physical universe lasts, right? It's, it's a lasting, I don't want to say eternal, but it's a lasting as long as the physical world lasts. That's a law. So then it doesn't matter after the fact you looked in the mirror and you realized you did that reactive thing whatever, last week, you can still fix it because the energy is still there. Why are you taking yourself to task? Because the energy is still there. Whatever it was, your act of revenge or your act of anger, still there so you can go back, use your tools, scan the Zohar, start sending light of apology, forgiveness, tolerance, whatever it was to that person or through that person to the world. Start fixing it. There's nothing that can't be fixed. Nothing, 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 nothing. And I'll throw it out to you, but I'm not going to spend the time right now because I see we're getting, uh, got to get going here. But the Rav even told us and explained to us how even, heaven forbid, a million billion times, when somebody murders somebody else, even that can be repaired. Even that can be repaired. Now, Please, please, a billion times over, do not misconstrue and think that I'm saying in any way, shape, or form that murder is okay. But once things happen, even on our level of things, just because it happened, set, what do we say, 70 years ago to the 85-year-old person, doesn't mean it can't be fixed. 
I'll tell you one quick story. Okay, no. Let, okay, I, I've said it one, a few times probably. Fourth grade, third grade. The teacher made us run the whole class from one, you know, one side of the playground to the other. So, of course, we're all running, 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 running. And my leg happened to be get caught up with this Marilyn's leg, and she fell. So we get to the fence, and the teacher's looking, because Marilyn, you fell, scraped her knee, and she's crying. Who did it? I was so scared. Of course. In third grade, I didn't understand my past lives. Once I understood my past lives, again, it was easier to see why. I was so scared. I didn't want to say a thing. So I didn't say a thing. Okay, nobody said anything, blah, blah, blah. So literally, fast forward probably 50 years. I'm meditating, and I remember third grade, I tripped Marilyn. So 21st century, I go online. I look up Marilyn in social media. Guess what? I could find her. So I must tell you, there was a little trepidation, but I write her. I said, hi, you know, this is me from fourth grade or third grade. Da -da. You remember, I just want to tell you, I am so sorry. When we were running, I told her the whole story. I said, I just want to apologize. I'm so sorry that I didn't say anything that or whatever. And she like, after a couple of days, I get a message. Big smiles like this and this, like, it's okay, <laughs> don't worry about it. You know, it's long gone like this. But imagine, I'm holding it, all this guilt and shame, for 50 years. Something like that. Till I had to fix it. So it's always fixable. It doesn't matter what it is and when it happened. It's always fixable because it's always out in the cosmos. So it's up to us to be able to learn how to see through the five senses, which is what we want to get to. We want to see as the Zohar calls it, with the eyes of our heart. The eyes in our head, easy to fool. The eyes of our heart, not easy. It can be blocked, but it can't be fooled. Most of us, in some level, have covered those eyes of our heart. The point of what we're learning here is how to open that up. You open up your heart, the eyes of your heart, you'll start to see. Everything is cause and effect. So it doesn't matter what it looks like. Just remember, if you're doing your spiritual work, you're paying off, they call it sweetening your judgment. I like to make it maybe in different terms for people. You're paying your debt at pennies on the dollar. If you're making an effort to be kinder, like we say, more kindness, love, compassion, generosity, etc. If we're making that effort, we're paying off our debt. So even if something comes back to us and it's a challenging situation, it's pennies on the dollar for what we owe. Like I told you, this guy, so I killed him 2,000 years ago, but all I had to put up with in this lifetime was being nagged and criticized and this and this. Okay, a little, you know, embarrassment, but that was also good for me. I learned how to be more humble. I learned how to not take it personally, certain things like that. So I made good use of it, but in its simplest form, thank God that it was only that. It wasn't exactly what most people say cause and effect, because I had, over the years, maybe over a lifetime, paid back some of it. So I didn't have to go through eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. So if you're doing your spiritual work, that's what's happening to you also. But I want to give you a story and then sort of close up, because I just read it. It was the, the call it, we call it the death anniversary, or the Hilula actually, the elevation day of the Baal Shem Tov, one of my favorite Kabbalists, who lived in the 16, 1700s. So I just reread the story, but it stuck very much in my heart. You know, there was a group of people who fought against the Baal Shem Tov, as unfortunately happens to all the great true Kabbalists. People are always against them because you want to bring light to the world, that opponent is going to work in the heads of all kinds of people, even what they call leaders and this and that, spirit, or not spiritual, religious leaders or whatever. So there's a whole group that was trying to, you know, stop the Baal Shem Tov from bringing light and peace and harmony and unity to the world. So on the outside, yes, he fought against them, not with anger or whatever, but in other words, you know, he didn't just sit back and say, oh, well, this is my tiko. No, he made an effort to expose their lies, falsehoods, etc. And when he defeated them, and they went even further away from the path of the light, he told his students, he said, we have to pray for their soul. Because even though on the outside they're acting in such evil, negative ways, we know that there's a spark of the light of the Creator inside all of them. So we have to pray, he called it, we have to pray for their soul to waken up and overcome the negativity that they've fallen into. 
how much they've listened to that opponent to do the evil things that they were doing. So I want us to be able to at least aspire to that. Think of the people you've had issues with, the people you're having issue with today in 2023. Pray for their soul, or in our terms, scan your Zohar, send them light, do the 72 names, send them light. Reach into their soul, wake up the light inside them. So the light will take away the darkness. Because if you're, if you're sending anger to their anger, you're just enhancing their negativity and yours at the same time. You send light to their soul, number one, light pouring out of you goes around the cosmos, more light comes back to you. And you will wake up their soul. So eventually, when there's enough awakening in them, they will also change. Because, you know, and, and it is Memorial Day here in America, which in America, and even here, it's sort of lost its meaning for most people, right? It's just a day you could go out for barbecue, have the day off, and have fun. It's supposed to be remembering the people who gave their lives in war for America. But let's use it in its higher level, and let's memorial, memory, let's remember what we learned from Kabbalah 1 forward, and for me, one of the most fundamental, essential things to keep in our mind. When we came out of the endless world, there was no we. There was one soul came out of the endless world. Then it extended into eight billion bodies. Extended. Didn't separate. Extend like my fingers, right? They're separate, but we know they're all connected, simplest terms, to my hand which is then connected to my arm, which is then connected to all the rest of me. So even though this way they look separate, they're all part of me. So too, our five sense eyes see eight billion, even here in this room, we all think we're separate from each other. No, we're like fingers. We're all united. So let's have Memorial Day mean that we remember there's only one soul and every human being on earth is on your side, on your team. Their soul is. Yes, we all act in our negative ways to some level. But remember, there's only one soul. And therefore, remember, and this is the key, that there's only one enemy of all 8 billion people. Whatever form of divisiveness we see going on in the world, that's not the real enemy. The other side. If you read the Zohar, when they say the other side, it doesn't mean another religion, another culture, another language, another color of people or whatever. No. It means the other side of the light, which means that nasty voice that we programmed to be a challenger to give us free will. That's our only enemy. The thought in our head of the challenger that says, no, be angry, be judgmental, be fearful. They're your problem. That's what we've got to remember. There's only one enemy, and if we all unite against that enemy, the enemy, the negative programming, once we finally take that out of the mind of every human being, then the only thing that everybody can express is their godlike nature. Love, kindness, and compassion to its highest degree. That's our job. So yeah, Memorial Day, but for many of you watching around the world, you don't have that, but we can all use it now. Let's remember only one enemy, let's de be determined to focus. And I want to, okay, in closing, it came out so nice, I'm just going to read it to you. The universe is coded. The infinite light is hidden in the codes of the physical material aspect of our world. The Kabbalah Center is teaching any person on earth who wants to come learn how to use the secret code of the light beyond the limitation of our five senses how to use the light beyond the limitation of our five senses to defeat the one enemy, that opponent, Satan, the challenger, the adversary, whatever name you give it. Share when you don't feel like it. That's how you defeat your enemy. Be it being kind when you're upset, speaking supportively when you want to tear somebody down, give abundantly when you feel like being miserly, Show gratitude when you feel jealous. Be forgiving when you feel like taking revenge. The ultimate of breaking the codes of the limitation, be loving to every person. 
when you want to ignore them, criticize them, argue with them, and so on. Because you're opening the eyes of your heart. So you begin more and more to see, to feel, that the light in their soul is eternally connected to the light in your soul. So then, loving your neighbors yourself is not just a moral, ethical, or religious doctrine. Loving your neighbors yourself becomes the smartest and the fastest way to achieve your soul's potential and live an amazingly happy and fulfilling life. God bless. So now is our time of the offering. One, I want to just thank all of you who continually support the program and the Kabbalah Center. And this is our way of giving back. You know, if you, if you gain something, I think I told you once this, okay. All right, why not? It's Memorial Day, let's remember. So years ago, in LA, I was teaching in LA, and this woman who actually was taking the class, but we were talking about another event, a spiritual event. And I said, you know, sign up for this, da, da, da. And she comes to me afterwards, she says, Chaim, how come spirituality, you're asking for money for things? And I looked at her and I said, well, let me ask you a question. If you don't want to pay for the spiritual awakening you're getting, for the spiritual understanding, then think of what you're telling the universe. As we said today, cause and effect. You're telling the universe that your socks are worth more than your soul. Because you're willing to pay $5 for your socks. You're not willing to pay for a spiritual event that's going to change your entire life. Hello, wake up. Wake up. Because then imagine what the universe has to be saying to her. Oh, you ask the universe for health and happiness and peace and protection. It says, no, not worth it. Your socks are more important to you. Here, I'll give you a pair of socks. That's what we got to start waking up and see. So that's why for us, for me, it's important, one, to appreciate those of you who contribute regularly. And we do this, we take a few moments just to bless the offering because you're putting consciousness in it. You're appreciating what the Creator gave you. You're sending it out through the projects of the center. As we said today, another form of understanding. The center is out to remove pain and suffering from 8 billion people. Doesn't matter, like we said today, it doesn't matter if you love them or hate them, so to speak, right now. We still want to remove the angel of death so that everybody will become the righteous people that the, or show reveal the righteous person that the Creator created us to be. Who on earth, and I know I'm being very open here, but who on earth is thinking like that? No less doing something about it. I don't care religious leaders, I don't care um, uh, uh, political leaders, whatever you want to call them. Who's thinking really 8 billion people to be united in peace and harmony without having to tell them they all have to be the same? No, the only thing, and this is why I keep emphasizing to you, it's only one thing that's common to every human being on earth. Only one thing. Only one. And if you think otherwise, please write me, let's have a discussion. The only one thing that's common to every person on earth is the soul. That's it. Once you look past the soul in the various layers of covering, you have all the differences. White, black, yellow, brown, Jew, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever else you want to call it. So the point of the center is the technology of the soul. That's what the Zohar is. That's why it goes to every person on earth. Regardless of who they are, what they are, even, even quote, not the nice people. You know how the, that we started with these, these little pocket Zohars? We started to print them, I think, in the late 80s because of all the tumult, the fighting and the hatred that was going on in the Middle East. Because we wanted to be able to give them. We know that the Zohar just shines the light of the Creator. And light's the only thing that will take away darkness. And the Zohar is the most powerful beacon of light. There are holy books. They shine light. Not denying that. But in my, the way I look at it, 5 watts versus the Zohar's 5 million watts. So it's all light, yes. But if you and I feel desperate for the end of pain, suffering, and death, we need the 5 million watts. Sure, you could still use the 5 watts, I'm not saying no, but speed up the process because we are desperate to finish it because we can see what's going on in the world. So we started to print these particular versions small because you can't go to the Palestinian police or soldiers or the Israeli soldiers and give them the big book of the Zohar and say, hey, keep this with you when you're out in the field. But this they could put in their flak jackets, they could put with them, easy to carry. Now you shine the light, and again, so you look, whichever side 
those people didn't like, we're giving it to everybody. Like I told you the Baal Shem Tov did. He prayed for the people who were trying to defeat bringing light to the world because he knew there was light inside them. So this is the most important project we've got is spreading the, this type of Zohar, the pocket Zohars that people can have, the books of the Zohar, the sacred Zohar, everything, that's it. Just put it around the world. You'll have so much light, you end all the darkness. No more darkness, everybody sees clearly and will act like the Creator created them to behave, that's all. So this is why it's essential to speed up the project. So whatever you give, whatever your heart is telling you to give, those of you here, oh, let me make sure for those of you online, hold it in your hand. For those of you online, I'm going to put the link that you can, after the meditation. So just hold your offering in your hands, remembering money is a vessel. And so we want to put the energy of the light, the light of our love, gratitude, compassion, and care. Because we've come to a higher level of understanding, truly embodying it in our heart. There's only one soul. Awakening the light in every human being on earth by sending it out of our heart and soul is the most powerful, effective way to bring us protection, to awaken the light inside every person to overcome their negative thoughts, their negative actions, and revealing the pure and perfect being of light that's in them. And again, cause and effect. So we know as we're giving in gratitude and appreciation from what the Creator has allowed us to be able to have and share that with others, we know that's going to go out into the world, create a circuit to come back to us, but as it does, multiplied many, many times over. And together we say, Amen. So also, before we go, what you see here, or on the screen here, this is one of the 72 names of God. It just... Oh, meditation music. We know that the Hebrew letters are the DNA of the soul. So again, the one common factor of every person is the soul. And our soul, like our body, is made up of physical DNA, A, T, C, and G, they call it. So the soul is made up of the 22, as we call them, Hebrew Aramaic letters. Which means they're not just letters, they're actually photons of the light of the Creator. So they just shine light. Doesn't matter if you understand them or not. In this case, we'll just know the letter, the names, Resh, He, Ein. And what they create is bringing the light out of the darkness, if you will. I know here it says a diamond in the rough, meaning it's bringing the diamond out of the piece of coal, so to speak. Light out of darkness, good out of bad, blessings out of chaos. And so that's what we want to enhance today. So just let the shapes be engraved in your mind's eye. Resh, He, Ein. Eyes are the window to the soul. Our soul already has all the programming, 100% of the light of the Creator. Our job is to awaken it and then reveal it, share it out into the world. Okay? So, if I can ask you to sit comfortably in your seat, feet flat on the floor, hands on your lap. Take a few deep breaths, breathing in through the nose. Hold the breath for a moment. Exhale through the mouth. Just allowing the physical air which carries the light of the Creator to flow through you. creating a stronger circulation of that light, of that pure power, of the endless light of the Creator. Awakening more of the light inside you, and as you're exhaling, letting go of the tension, the blockages, whatever form of reactive energy that you've been carrying, Begin creating a space and a pathway for it to leave you.
And now let's visualize above our heads the 72 name of Resh He Ein. Seeing these nanoparticles of the light of the Creator shining bright. The three particular energies united into this beautiful glow of pure white light of the endless world. Vibrating with the energy that can bring light out of darkness, blessings out of curse, order out of chaos, clarity out of obscurity. And slowly allow these three energy forces to enter through the top of your head. Activating the light of the Creator in every part of your body as you let it flow, Reish He Ein, from head to toe. Allowing this energy, this light, as it vibrates, activating the light in every cell of your being. Strengthening the connection between body and soul. So that it's the soul's light that's guiding the physical regeneration of cells and the spiritual reawakening to the true, pure and perfect light being that you are. Now focusing this energy, Reish He Ein, in the mind, in the heart, and the soul. That there's a unity being created. So that the eyes of our heart see more clearly. feeling more and more the true oneness of all humanity. And that our mind is more intensively focused on the one enemy that we all have, that opposing voice in our head, challenging us to do the self-centered reactive behavior and with this new awakening through the Reish He Ein, more clarity, the voice of our soul, the voice of the Creator inside of us, louder, more clear, the light stronger. And so together we let a beam of light from the essence of our heart, our soul, shine out and let it reach through the heart and soul of every human being on earth. That you see from your point of view the eight billion pathways that have always been there connecting you with every human being on earth with the light in their soul, now seeing it in your mind's eye clearly, that it will always be remembered. We are one soul. And remembering then, it's to my personal advantage to always send light, 
always behave as the light, to always do actions of sharing the light on the next higher level until I reveal all 100% of the light the Creator implanted in me. See that light that you've been sending out to eight billion parts of yourself, just glowing bright, that you see the world surrounded in a sphere of light. And we envision together people acting with pure love, kindness, unity, true care for every other person on earth. Take note of the greater sense of peace that you're feeling now. The awakening of a greater sense of joy and serenity as you're seeing your world filled with light. And realizing and embodying your true power the power to channel the infinite light of the Creator in every way, shape, or form. Let this vision, this feeling, this vibration be anchored in your heart, soul, and mind. That more and more from this day forward is at the forefront of your thinking. This vision is always in front of your eyes the true eyes of your heart. And let this new awakening allow your physical eyes to just be conduits for the eyes of your heart, that you begin to see more and more past the five senses and see more of the light vibrating out of every person on earth. And together we would take one more deep breath to anchor this forever in our heart, soul, and mind, and then slowly exhale as you open your eyes. One thing I want to throw out to uh, those of you out there online, uh, when I put the little uh, post that I started an in-person class here in Boca, a lot of you asked, could we do something on Zoom? So I want to throw it out to those of you who are out there you know, who aren't near a center, if you'd like to do a Spiritual Sunday Kabbalah one, just write me and we can arrange a, a Zoom uh, class Kabbalah one that we could do together. So if you'll send me a message or put it on the comments, I'd like to arrange that if you have the desire. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you. Those of you who are here joining us, those of you joining us online, have an amazing week, a good weekend, <laughs> but always just to remember, what well, we said, one enemy, and that's what we're going to get rid of in our time. May it be that way. 
God bless. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you liked what you saw, subscribe to this channel that you'll be notified when we post new videos. Share the video with your friends. They can also benefit. And check out the website, www.kabbalah.com, that's K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H, for hundreds of articles and classes. Wish you an amazing day, and God bless.